purposely. Your life, God's purpose. Listen at purposely.com. Welcome to the bonfire, and we're in a season where we're focusing on Jesus and his healing. And as you open up the Bible, you see Jesus is a healer, and he heals on many levels. It's physically, relationally, emotionally, and spiritually, and he does it at the same time. As he does this, we're encouraged and inspired that we want to go to Jesus with our pain points. We want to go to Jesus with our infirmities, and there's hope in the Lord. The hope of Jesus, it's indestructible, it's infinite, and we need more of his presence, more of his hope. I pray that as we walk through some of these passages, that you would grow in your relationship with God. I want to seek God more. I want to pursue God. We're journeying together. And that's what the bonfire is all about. A community of people who want more of the Lord. God is love. God is light. God is a consuming fire. We want the stories of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord. And we gather together as a community because we know there's more. We reject the narrative of hopelessness in the culture today. And we're going to look at Mark chapter 7. And this passage often refers to the healing of a deaf and mute man. Now Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre. I'm starting in verse 31. And Jesus went through Sidon, down by the Sea of Galilee, and into the region of the Decapolis. The Decapolis, the ten cities there. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. Then they begged him to place his hand on the man. If you picture a man who can't, you know, hear and talk, and yet there's a community of people that care for this man, that's something to celebrate. There's a lot of people who are hurting and they feel alone. There's a lot in the deaf community that feel like people don't know them or want to get to know them, or it's extra effort to get to know them, or who's going to learn sign language? Who's going to fully understand? And to not be able to hear and talk, most of us can't even relate to that. We don't know what that would be like. He has a community that's wise. They go to the Lord. What does it say? They begged Jesus to place his hands on the man. That tells you this is a community of faith. And a community of faith should be the ones that are most eager, most yearning, most desperate in terms of reliance to go to the Lord. Because we know where the healing is. And if Jesus just places his hand on the man... They're trusting that there can be great healing. This Decapolis, you know, reminds me here of Mark chapter 5, where there's a man who had a legion of demons. And what did Jesus do? Drove the demons out. The demons ran into the pigs, the pigs over the cliff. And then the people said, Jesus, please leave the region. Jesus did end up leaving that region, but he left the man who he healed. The man who was healed of the demons said, Jesus, let me travel with you. And Jesus said, no, stay here in the Decapolis and tell the people everything that I've done for you. And this man knew where he lived, works, learn, and plays. That's what I like to say, live, work, learn, or play in those spaces. In which relationships? With your friends, relatives, acquaintances, neighbors, and coworkers. In those relationships, start to tell your story of how Jesus changed your life. And here we are in the Decapolis, and it'd be interesting to see the different healing that Jesus brought, who was talking about it, who believed in Jesus, how faith grew. Here we have a community of faith. They have faith enough to know that the Savior, the Messiah, is here, and with his touch, there can be healing. That's a great place to start. If you have a situation or condition where you really know you can't, in your own strength, just turn that around, You cry out to God. Just cry out to Jesus. Ask for his touch. And after he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. The Lord has so many different ways of healing. I mean, you think about that spit and touching eyes, touching tongues. Uh, You think about him just touching ears. And Jesus, the way he brings healing... It could be a hundred different varieties. God might bring healing into your life through just the sunshine. He might bring healing through an encouraging note or card. It could be a gift. It could be a time of worship. It could be a specific scripture. God's going to bring healing in a myriad of ways. And here, 
he brings healing. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. Once again, the power of God's word. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Sun, moon, and stars, because God declared it. His word brings forth uh, results. He said to Lazarus, who is dead, Lazarus, come forth, and Lazarus was alive again. His words have power. That's why I say spend time in the word. Let the word dwell in you richly. The word of Jesus, meditation, memorizing his word, receiving his word, believing his word. In this instance, he declares it. Sometimes it's conditional. Sometimes it's unconditional, but his word is powerful. It never comes back void. And at this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak plainly. Can you imagine what that would be like to not be able to hear for all those years, not be able to talk for all those years, and with the touch of the Savior, now you have the ability. It's a wonder when little kids have their milestones, when a young child can suddenly walk, when a young child is potty trained, doesn't need a diaper, when a young child can talk, when a young child can learn sports, when a young child academically starts to progress, learns mathematics. I mean, it's a wonder, that kind of development and a discovering and a developing of these abilities that are God-given. Well, similarly, there's a wonder when there's been an inability, and then Jesus, and this is sudden, sometimes it's gradual, sometimes it's sudden, but Jesus brings that forth. Maybe you've had seasons where you serve God in one capacity, but then for whatever reason, you got discouraged and you step back and you stop serving God and you kind of feel like it was collecting dust on the shelf. But then God brings you forth again and you're like, I'm alive again. And this ability, it doesn't define, any of our sicknesses and illnesses don't define us. That's not our identity. Our identity is in Christ. But it is true that when we regain abilities and when God graces us like that, we come alive in a new and special way. This healing is powerful. And it's a reminder that when we get to heaven, all of our sicknesses, all of our ailments, all of our illnesses, all the ways that our body doesn't work how we want it to now, that will be in the past. God makes all things new and will finally be all God's designed us to be. Every healing that you read in the story is in the Bible. They're a picture of what's coming for all of us in heaven. Until then, while we're on earth, we also need God's touch and healing. And that's what Jesus did. He touched, he healed, and now the man can hear, and now the man can talk. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. And you read that, you're like, wait, what? Jesus healed this man and then told everyone, don't talk about it? There's times when Jesus in the Bible says, testify. And then there's times when Jesus says, let's keep that quiet. That might surprise you. Why does he do that? Jesus has an impeccable sense of timing. And he knows there's oppositions. And he knows that some people want to kill him. And if there's too much momentum early, he's a greater threat. He knew the exact right time to come to earth. He knew when he would go to the cross and die for our sins and lay down his life. And he knows the spiritual leaders and what they're thinking and the threats and the opposition. All that to say, when you read this in the Bible, that's not really the norm. It's more descriptive given that specific context. The norm for us, as Jesus tells us, is to go make disciples, share the gospel, share your story, don't hold back, don't be intimidated. But the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. So here it's kind of ironic. Jesus says, don't talk about it. And what did they do? Talk about it. Have you ever heard some news that you probably thought, I should keep that quiet? But you got so excited that you just started talking about it. To the wrong people, too early. It was supposed to be a surprise party, but you started talking about it. No one wanted you to know that they were dating, but then you found out you started to talk about it. You started to talk about blessings and plans. And he's like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said all that. They are just so excited about this healing that they're talking about it. And the irony is Jesus says, not now, and they jump in to testifying. And here's, here's the kick. Now we're in a season where Jesus says, testify and talk. And a lot of times we're staying quiet. It's just our human nature sometimes, and it's part of being human. 
is that it's hard to follow Jesus. It's hard to follow God. And for us in the flesh, we often do the opposite thing of what he's telling us. You got to trust God. Listen to God. They look to the cloud. When the clouds stay, they stay. When the cloud moves, they move. When Jesus says talk, we talk. When Jesus says be quiet, we be quiet. And here, Jesus said not yet, and they talked anyways. But for a lot of us, Jesus is saying share it. And we're saying, I don't want to. I don't feel comfortable doing that. Let's trust the Lord. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Quick comment on he has done everything well. You know, sometimes if you serve, there's a culture of perfection where no one can ever fail. And there's all kinds of pressure. And it said, we're doing this for the Lord, so it's got to be perfect. That doesn't really bring out the best in you. At the same time, the other extreme is that, well, good enough. You know, stuff happens at church, like people not showing up when they said they would commit or volunteer, or it's kind of a half-hearted effort, or the committee is, you know, just limping along and saying, well, something's better than nothing. Both of those mindsets in both of those cultures are detrimental. Neither is coming from Scripture. If it's either like permission to slack, be lazy, not keep your word, not really work unto the Lord with all your heart, that's not good. That's not coming from God. And then on the flip side, uh, when it's an environment where you are under pressure constantly, there's no grace, there's no understanding, and the expectations are beyond what's reasonable, and then you're criticized when you shouldn't be criticized, and you just feel like you're white-knuckling it, and you just don't know, you know if, if anyone's ever going to be happy, and no one ever celebrates the work that God's doing, no one ever is grateful. Like those two extremes, you avoid those. When this says Jesus does everything well, of course he's sinless. Of course his teaching is far beyond anyone else. Of course, the miracles are unprecedented and unrivaled. Like there are aspects to Jesus' ministry that we just can't accomplish because we fall short of his glory. What inspires us when we read he does everything well is that we want to bring our best unto the Lord. We want to rely on the Holy Spirit. We want to have healthy teams. We want to glorify the Lord. We want to see lives changed. We want to be faithful stewards of what God has given to us. And it could be that you're in a church environment right now where you want to inspire and mobilize and encourage people. Because there's a lot of people just watching, a lot of people dabbling, a lot of people, you know, just kind of hit and miss. No, let's together, let's honor the Lord. Let's do it with gratitude for all Jesus has done for us. And let's create that kind of a culture. Jesus, wherever he went, he's doing things well, and that catches their attention. They're talking about that. When you do things well, people are going to appreciate you. They're going to talk about that. They're going to notice it. And most importantly, God notices it. God's going to reward you, and it's going to be worth it. Keep going the extra mile consistently and do it in Jesus' name. This is the story of a man, and you think about the hearing, and you think about the speaking, and how Jesus healed him. And I want you to take some time today and think through those two parts of your life. How's your listening and how's your speaking? Let's start with the listening. And, uh, you know, I said a lot of people, they don't have the ability to listen. Let's care for people who are in the deaf community. Let's build relationships. Let's encourage. Let's pray for those in the deaf community. Did you know of all the languages right now that don't have the Bible, many of them, are for people who are deaf. And who's going to translate the Bible? Who's going to bring the scripture to people who can't hear? That's something that still needs to be done. So that's one um, part of hearing that I want to mention. But most people that are obviously uh, watching right now, listening right now, like you've had the ability to hear. You can probably hear pretty well. You might have a hearing aid. But how's your listening? Listening comes from the ability to hear. The ability to hear is just a starting point but then there's a listening. Let me ask you, do you listen to God? What does it look like to listen to God for you? Is it intentional silence? How do you turn on the volume of the culture? How do you slow down? How do you become less distracted? What needs to get removed out of your life? 
I'm talking about becoming familiar with the voice of the Savior. Jesus is the good shepherd. He said, my sheep know my voice. And listening, being sensitive to the Holy Spirit, the promptings, the rebukings, the teachings that all come, and the communication through God's word and spirit. And be someone who listens to God. Those who listen to God in the Bible are faithful to God. They become doers of the word. They're eager to listen. When you hear God's voice and you know what he's saying, it propels you to want more. And to be a good steward of your ear is to listen to the Lord. Always value his voice first. And if you're not intentional to slow down, you're going to miss so much of what God is saying. You're going to run ahead of God. You're going to be in battles you don't need to be in. You're going to have unnecessary headaches and heartaches. You're going to be doing things uh, with your will instead of God's will. People who don't listen are often not in step with the Holy Spirit. Listen to God. I love to go on walks. That's where I like to listen to God. And as I go on walks and no one else is around, I'm just tuned in. I'm not really there to talk as much. I'm there to listen. Set aside time in your schedule where you're listening to God. When I'm in the car, sometimes I'm just listening to God. I'll just take a break, sit down, lie down, and listen to God. When you start to get overwhelmed, that's probably time to listen. So cultivate that habit of listening to God and then listening well to other people. This one's tough for extroverts. It's tough for me. It's easier for me to talk to you about talking because that comes more natural than listening a lot of times. In conversations and in ministry for me, I'm quick to talk instead of the Bible saying be quick to listen. Listen to other people. A whole world is opened up for this man because he can listen. In this ability, it's easy to take it for granted and not really listen to God, not really listen to the people that we love the most. And you need to turn down the volume and turn off a lot of voices in your life. There are a lot of people on social media who are throwing darts at you, who are spreading lies, who are pulling you away from God. If someone's pulling you away from God, it's not from God. Don't listen to everyone equally. Be discerning, be selective, and listen uh, as you listen to God and listen to other people. Listen to how God's leading you. Because once you do listen to God and other people, now doors are going to open. And all of this is healing. It's going to be healing with you and God. It's going to be healing with some of the people. They're going to feel so loved when you listen to them. And it's going to be healing as you listen to God and people and then enter in with a timely word, knowing how to serve them, meet their needs. Listening is a key part of ministry. And if you haven't been listening well, take some time to slow down. Just practically, when someone talks to you, don't be thinking about your response. Don't be thinking about what you want to say. Just listen with the goal of understanding. Repeat back to them. This is what I'm hearing. Is this what you're saying? And as you listen to people and you really hear them well, you might not have to talk as much. Because instead of just like 20 comments across the board, you're going to have one comment. It's just going to nail it. So let's listen. And this reminds us of the gift of listening. And there's a lot of healing that's tied to listening. Jesus also touches this man's mouth and he's able to talk. And mark your words when you talk. Think before your words. Prayerful words. The Bible says, speak what builds people up. Don't gossip and slander. Don't exaggerate. Don't make big promises and then not keep your word. And all these things, your mouth is powerful. It's like you got a ship moved by a rudder. You have a forest fire, began with a spark. This man has all these new abilities because he can listen and he can speak. And as you read this, you might not appreciate this miracle as much because if your entire life you've been able to listen and speak, you just kind of take it for granted. Like, yeah, I've got that. I've got that ability. What's next? But for this man, there's a new opportunity. And I want to encourage you, when God heals you, there's a new opportunity. When God heals you and moves in your life, he opens a door with the healing. You are going to lead people to Jesus. You're going to serve people. You're going to love people. And sometimes your strengths are going to stand out. Your gifts are going to stand out. And God's going to use those. But this is really where I've seen ministry happen is that when God heals you in a certain area and you share the story of what your condition was and how God met you and what God did to turn things around, that's the story that people are going to connect with the most because people relate to pain, they relate to suffering, they relate to then uh, having God come in 
and make the difference. In our city, which is the greater Seattle area, the results are about 7% in terms of the city's effort to help homeless people in a full restoration. Those who are addicted, those who have uh, real challenges with drugs and alcohol. For the Seattle Union Gospel Mission, their restoration percentage is about 70%. Think of the difference between 7% and 70%. What is this? I can say it's the Jesus factor. It's a relationship with Jesus. It's the healing of Jesus. It's how Jesus will meet someone in any condition. And we all have our addictions. We all have our patterns of sin. We all have our negative thinking and the spirals that come with it. Jesus will meet you and then heal and transform. And then that testimony why is that powerful? Because you're going to want to help people who have had the same condition that you've had. And Jesus is going to help this one. And as this one, really new open doors. When God heals you, there's new open doors. And I've been able to share my story and the struggles I've had and the different things I've gone through physically and emotionally and relationally. And those have created new open doors. So what, what do we learn from this story today? We all have specific areas where we need God to touch us. Would you identify two of those today? If I said, what are your top two areas? And if Jesus was right here as a healer, you would say this one and this one. The man points to the ear and to the tongue. He has not had the ability right here and right here. If Jesus was coming and really taking inventory of your life and where is it? Where's the lack? Where's the pain? Where's the disappointment? You would say right here and right here. What are those two areas for you? Would you bring those forth to the Lord today? Would you bring those forth and say, Jesus, please, as this community of faith begs Jesus, would you touch this man? Would you touch our friend? Would you touch our brother? Would you touch our sister in these two areas today in Jesus' name? Bring those two areas to the Lord and say, here they are, Lord. And then be open to how God heals. When Jesus spits, that's part of the process. Jesus is going to do some things in your life. It's part of the healing process. And as he brings those blessings in these two areas, notice what he's doing. I want you in this journey over the next month, and as you're listening to this season of the bonfire, you can go back to the other uh, passages on healing. And together, it's really forming a vision, some encouragement we're looking at how did Jesus heal then? How does Jesus heal now? What are the different realms of our life? And today, I want this one to stand out in terms of here's the two, Jesus. Maybe you've been listening to the bonfire the last couple episodes and you've been hearing about the healing and the longing has increased. But today, would you identify two? Right now, identify two. Take your minute and identify. Say, it's this and this. These are the two areas that are really struggling in my life that have been disappointing. There's a lack. There's a want. There's a lot of pain involved. They bring me down. I think about them all the time. I can't do certain things because of it. Lord Jesus, here they are, and I'm begging you. I'm asking you. I'm pleading with you. Please come and move in these areas and heal. And whether you change the situation or you change me, I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know what song. I don't know what passage. I don't know what person you're going to bring into my life, what truth truth you're going to bring to shatter the lies. But these two areas right now, Lord, I'm asking that you would touch them and that you would start a healing process this month, God, that there would be clear healing in these two areas. Take that posture. You might be thinking, wait a minute, I was just listening to a podcast. I was just listening to the bonfire. I just wanted to get a couple of verses, a couple of insights. Like, what, what is this? No, this is where we get involved. This is where we participate. There's participation in every healing story. And the participation today that I'm asking you to take is to identify these two areas, bring them to the Lord, and then just say, Lord, may your will be done. May your healing power be evident. Whatever the process is that you want, whatever your timing is, Jesus, I'm going to notice what you start to do. I'm going to pay attention in these two areas. God, I surrender them to you. They're not mine, they're yours. And God, come in and start to move in these areas. I invite you. You're the king of glory. I open up the gates. May the king of glory come in. And as Jesus moves in these two areas of your life, will you do this? Will you write down what you see him doing? What is he teaching you? How is he encouraging you? How is he shifting your perspective? How is he changing the circumstances? How is he bringing truth? How is he building you up? How is his power made perfect in your weakness? How is his grace sufficient? Would you just start noticing that? Because 
it's possible that you've been discouraged and these have been weighing you down and they're just eating up your motivation. And until you invite the Lord in and start to walk closely with God in these areas, open up the door, invite the Holy Spirit into these two areas, and then just note what God does. There might be some incredible quick turnarounds that God brings in these two areas for you. Or it might be a gradual path of obedience and a steady path where you keep walking the walk and you keep picking up the manna each day, but God's grace will be enough. And you're going to realize that you're secure in the Lord, you're loved in the Lord, that God is with you, God has a plan and a purpose. And remember, out of your pain is often your greatest testimony. So yes, you can impress people with some accomplishments and some exciting things in your life that are going really well, but where people are going to feel really close to you is when you let them into these pain areas and you share with them and you pray with them. And when you let the Lord in, your relationship with God grows because now you don't push him out of these areas, you invite him in, and now you're processing with him, receiving from him, talking to him, noticing what he's saying, noticing how he sees it, and Jesus' power is going to be evident in your life. I want you to give a testimony in these two areas. I want you to give a testimony of what God has done. You see, they start talking. They're overwhelmed with amazement. You're going to have some amazement when you see God move in the areas of your life that feel bleak. There's going to be some amazement. God does everything well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. They're talking about what God's doing. And I want you to talk about what God's doing in these two areas of your life. Choose friends that you can trust, family members that you can trust. Uh, Think about who you're talking to, but then also other settings. It's going to be like your small group, your life group. It's going to be your church setting. There's going to be other places to give testimony, social media. And you're going to be talking about how God has worked in these two areas of your life. I believe testimonies are coming. I believe God's a healer. And I believe as God moves in your life, it's not just for you, it's for other people as well. As God works in your life, share that story. Encourage someone else. The areas where I've seen God heal my life, I just keep reaching out and finding people in those situations. And then I share. I share what I've learned. I share some practical steps and a roadmap. I share about who Jesus is. And those pain areas and those voids become your greatest testimonies. Those areas of your life where you struggle the most, that becomes your greatest passion of how you want to help other people. And this man who can now talk, this man who can now hear, all these relationships are opened up. And through your testimony and through the healing Jesus is going to bring, all these relationships, there's going to be blessings that flow. So don't let the enemy get in. The accuser, the discourager. Don't let him have the final say. Invite Jesus in. Say, here they are, Lord. Touch me. These two areas. And then share that story. Let's give Jesus glory. This is the bonfire we get into scripture. We bring the stories of our life and God is working in our lives. This isn't just for knowledge. It's for a close relationship, abiding, an encounter with Jesus. And I believe in these areas where we have pain, we need healing. Those are the areas Jesus moves and that's where God gets glory. So let's continue to seek Jesus. Invite him in and praise him together. Thanks for checking out the bonfire today. Share this with other people if you've been encouraged. We're on a healing journey together, and Jesus is our healer.